Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the museum. I'm John Holler, the CEO, and I'm happy to welcome you on behalf of our trustees and our staff and our members and the 200 or so amazing volunteers who work here every day and every week. It's great to have you here for another of our revolutionary sessions. This one is a very special one, a little bit of a reprise of a session we did last year. It was very similar to this one, and I want to thank uh, Intel Corporation for providing all the major support that Intel provides for this series. This is the sixth consecutive year that Intel has provided funding for revolutionaries, and we're very, very grateful to them for that. Let me tell you about a couple of up upcoming events uh, so that you can keep track of our calendar, and all of this is on our website at computerhistory.org. Tomorrow, tomorrow night at 7 o'clock, Bob Bowman, who is the CEO of Major League Baseball Advanced Media, is going to be here. And if you happen to see the session we did last August, just before the America's Cup started, and you liked that, you're going to love Bob Bowman and all the things that Major League Baseball's digital arm is doing for baseball this season. So I'd encourage you to come see Bob tomorrow night at 7. Then next week on Wednesday, March 12th, a slightly different time. This one will be at 3 o'clock. Peretz Levy, Professor Peretz Levy, who is the president of the Technion in Israel, Israel's MIT, is going to be here to talk about everything that they're doing, including their bold new partnership with Cornell, to build a new technology center, an education center on Roosevelt Island in New York. And then on Thursday, March 27th at 7 o'clock, we'll be presenting the art and technology of Cirque du Soleil. Cirque du Soleil has been one of the leaders in entertainment technology for the last 30 years. Not a well-known fact, but they're doing a spectacular new show which features a holographic performance by Michael Jackson. So if you want to find out how that is being done, please come see that on March 27th. Let me remind you, you have question cards on your chairs. Please fill those out. We'll be collecting those. That's how you get involved in today's program. We definitely want to hear from you. And also, there are survey cards on your chairs. So if you have some feedback for us, we'd love to hear from you. Please fill those out, and we'll be collecting those at the end of the program. And if you're tweeting, uh, you can use the hashtag that is on the screen, CHM Digital Age. Please just silence your phones if you would. And now for today's program. Nicholas Negroponte at MIT said recently that computing is no longer about computers, it's about living. No wonder then that the companies who are achieving the greatest success in our field today have leadership who think not just about technology, but about the lives that we lead and the lives we will lead in the future because of it. Eric Schmidt and his colleague Jared Cohen are a perfect example of this type of leadership. In their book, The New Digital Age, they write in compelling and personal terms about the impact of technology today and the implications for all of us in the future. Eric is, of course, executive chairman of Google and a frequent guest and a very good friend of the museum. Jared is the director of Google Ideas and served in the State Department on the staffs of Secretaries Condoleezza Rice and Hillary Clinton. Together, they write insightfully about how technology is changing the definitions and the working of democracy, citizenship, security, diplomacy, freedom, and personal relationships. Moderating today is another of those thoughtful leaders in technology and life, Facebook's Chief Operating Officer Sheryl Sandberg, whose book Lean In led all of the bestseller lists around the country in 2013. Eric interviewed Sheryl on this stage last year. You may have been here for that. And today, she gets to turn the tables, as she promised she would, at the end of that fascinating conversation. So please join me in welcoming Eric Schmidt, Jared Cohen, and Sheryl Sandberg. Thank you. Well, it is really exciting to be back at the Computer History Museum with um, my good friend, mentor, uh, colleague, Eric Schmidt, and my friend, uh, Jared. Last time we were here, we were talking about Lean In, and today we are talking about the new digital age and the future of the world. You know, I mean, you've really <laughs> done, done this job on Google now, because I keep running into Lean In, Lean In, Lean In within Google. <laughs> we're excited. It's like you still work there. <laughs> We're excited, um, but it's a real treat for me. Eric, um, I owe my career to Eric. Eric was the first person who hired me in Silicon Valley, and many people it, wouldn't, so. It worked out well I'm for you. <laughs> You've done so much better since you left Google. Well, well I, uh, I feel lucky because we talk about this a lot. Everyone needs the mentors and sponsors in your life, and Eric has been that and continues to be that for me, and I'm so grateful. And I first met Jared when I first came to Facebook and he is friends with our head of product, Chris Cox. 
And Chris said, there's this one guy in the State Department, and he totally gets it. And he runs around the world trying to get other people to get it. And so he has been a voice that has been super important to our industry and uh, to technology, and I think to peace all over. So exciting to be here with both of you. So we're going to start at the beginning. You're both fairly busy dudes, right? I mean, job, job. And it's not even that obvious that you would even know each other that well. So let's start at the beginning. You tell the story so nicely in the book. How did you meet? And what would possess you to sit down and write this? Where does this card? Well, you know, <laughs> my friend Don wanted to visit his son in, who was fighting in Iraq. And so I went along. I figured, you know, Thanksgiving in Iraq with the troops would be sort of interesting. And so we, we show up in Baghdad. I think we were the first people to show up on a commercial flight sort of got lost in the airport with the Marines on the other side. Did they know what to do with you? I mean, you're, <laughs> no. go this way, sir, you know? All right. And so Hi, Jared, here I am in Baghdad. So okay. Jared, uh, I, I meet Jared, and I t because it was such an interesting visit, my daughter Sophie was with us, and we took videos. And I remember playing the videos when I got home, and all I heard was Jared's voice. Talk, talk. Talk, talk, now, is that because talk. he talked the most or because he had the best things to say? No, he just talked the most. <laughs> <laughs> well, what I remember about Eric, so we get, to, we get to the airport, and normally people, when you arrive and you don't see the guards anywhere, they're like eager to get out of there. Um, in Eric's case, they put this flak jacket on him, and they're ready for him to go. And what does he do? Before he will leave the airport to go to the green zone, he insists on asking the security detail to give him an in depth history of flak jackets. And it's not because he's worried about his safety and security, it's because he's a geeky scientist and wants to really understand the history of flak jackets. Why is this Velcro here? At what stage in its history did it move from over there? Why doesn't it, why doesn't it protect certain parts of me? <laughs> <laughs> was there an answer to that? <laughs> not one not the one Marines that Marines were true. willing to reveal. But, 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 but Cheryl, the, 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 the lesson of this experience is you know, when, you, when you travel in a war zone with, with, with somebody, you become very close with them. And since then, we've traveled to uh, somewhere between 40 and 45 countries together. And when we first began this journey, we had an argument about stability versus instability. Um, Eric wanted stability, nice hotels, kind of you know, easy to Would go in and stop? out. Would you stop? Look, the basic <laughs> problem here is that Jared does not like to go to normal places, <laughs> right? So he has never been to South Korea, and he wants to go to North Korea. And there's, one, there's only one place I couldn't convince Eric to come uh, to with me, which was Somalia. And it was probably better. There's no hotels at all. <laughs> <laughs> or, or government, or banks, or institutions. Yes, that is true. So I'm still not going. <laughs> I already well, It's actually the one place where I don't think I'm going to go back. Oh, shocking. <laughs> and of course, we, been we, we go tough. to South Sudan. We, we somehow convinced him to go to South Sudan. It's the world's newest country. Uh, so we get there, and 98% of South Sudan's uh, uh, revenue comes from oil. And the government in Khartoum uh, has basically cut off the pipeline. Um, and so they basically have no money, no roads, no police force, nothing. And so they have an, the leadership has an hour with the two of us. And what do they choose to do? Spend their entire time. Uh, handing us their Android devices, asking us if we can debug maps for them. <laughs> Priorities. By the right, way, so one, one of those guys is the rebel president now. It's unclear whether he's still involved in governing. Okay. He seems to have left. Right, Welcome so to you're, So the you're the watching world. the video, and you're listening to Jared's voice, and this makes you want to write a book. No, I, so I eventually <laughs> talked to Jared, uh, you know, and we met in New York, and I said, what do you want to do? And he said, I wanted to write a book. And he started talking about his ideas, and I said, that sounded pretty interesting to me. Because it turns out that I, there's, the foreign policy people sort of don't understand technology, and the technology people don't really understand foreign policy, and I certainly don't understand foreign policy. So in wandering around, you'd be shocked at how miserable most people's lives are like. Right? We take, we take our, the, the wonderful world around us for granted. We're very fortunate here. Maybe we could fix some of these problems. If we work together. So the book starts out with two really bold sentences, and I'm going to ask each one of you about one. Eric, this was a hard one for me to read. You, you write the book, and it says, the internet is among the few things human beings have built that they don't truly understand. I know I don't understand the internet, but I felt very certain you did. <laughs> <laughs> and to be honest, if you don't understand the internet, I'm pretty sure really no one does. And even at the Computer History Museum, that's a little concerning. 
But Eric, what do you mean? What do you mean by, by we don't no. understand? That is built by humans, but we don't understand. My career has been, for the last 35 years, within a half a mile of our physical location right now. And I'm constantly surprised. I think I kind of understand it, and then something wild and wacky comes up. I, I remember in 1993 sitting in my office a half a mile from here at Sun, thinking, things are really boring, and I kind of understand it all. And that was the month I saw Netscape, or what the Mosaic browser at the time. People are enormously creative. They're enormously surprising. They are not utilitarian and follow rules and so forth and so on. And the internet is the first time when we can hear all of them at once. And I think that for the next 10 or 20 years, we're going to see more surprises, more good surprises and more bad surprises. Right? And, and all of us here in this room, we live with this. Oh my god, WhatsApp worth $16 billion, as an example. <laughs> Just as an example, <laughs> not relevant to not relevant to today's discussion. Jared, sorry, Cheryl, I didn't. No, that no, was no, a we're little good, low we're blow. Good. Jared, um, the next sentence in the book is actually amazing. The internet is the largest experiment involving anarchy in history. You are a student and a scholar and a practitioner of what is civil society and what is democracy and states. Why is this anarchy? So, if you think about. Uh, the definition of anarchy in the context of international relations. It was coined in the, the early 20th century around the idea that even though every piece of territory on Earth is or will be carved up into some kind of sovereign territory, the world is uh, not governable in the sense that there's no central leadership. And then if you fast forward, every attempt that the world has made to try to create a global leadership body, it, it's basically been rendered ineffective, which is one of the challenges of international institutions. Then you look at the internet, with only 2.4 billion people online today, and another 5 billion people coming online, think about the trouble that states are already having in dealing with this mass migration to the online world. Uh, so then you add another 5 billion people, and the prospects of, you know, one, replicating the laws of the physical world in cyberspace, you know, seem very difficult, and then two, controlling the entire thing is a far more difficult experiment than controlling the physical territory. We, we, we can't even agree on some basic rules between countries. So now we've got to deal with globalization of issues of copyright, issues of censorship, issues of free speech, issues of morality and communications. What do we do when something bad is happening? And I think the other thing is that, and we've been, since we've been on book tour for a while, we've been talking about this, maybe there are limits to what the internet can do. Maybe there are some problems that not even the internet can At the can Computer solve. History Museum, you're willing to say such a bold statement? <laughs> we might discuss that. There too. might be limits. But also, we, we, we describe the internet in the book as the world's largest ungoverned space. And if you think about the instruments of state power, militaries, economic power, et cetera, um, you know, they don't really work in the online world, say, as effectively as they do. But, but talk in the about Westphalia. So the, the Treaty of Westphalia, which basically established the international system of, of, of sovereign states, you know, is based on, a, on an idea that you can you know, uh, have different legal jurisdictions that are guarded by physical boundaries. All of that begins to break down as these worlds come online. What, what's interesting is what it does to disrupt the balance of power in the world. Um, so one of the arguments we make in the book is that you know, states will have you know, their physical power, which is based on traditional instruments that we discussed before, but a state may be, more, may be a cyber power in the online world when in fact it's very physically weak. So if you look at like Estonia and Sweden, these are two countries that can punch way above their weight in a world that's you know, completely connected. So, so after a couple of years of learning about foreign policy, mostly because Jared talks a lot, uh, <laughs> and, and I sort of concluded that foreign policy has not changed in a long time, right? It's sort of, there are these realists and these you know, progressives and so forth, and he explained all this to me. But I thought, in technology, what's new, right? What is, in fact, new is the empowerment that smartphones and the internet are providing to citizens. That is, in fact, a new thing. Another thing that's new is data permanence. Right? So the ability information once essentially leaked or published is generally known and can't be put back in the box. We didn't have those opportunities or problems before. So that drives lots of issues in, a, in essentially a static world like foreign policy. So again, you said a very bold thing here, which is the internet can't fix everything. What, what are those things? When you think about it, what are those things? Because as technologists, you and I, many people in this audience, we are big believers in the power of what technology can do, of bringing it to more people. Your book focuses a lot on what happens when another 5 billion people come online. I know Google's very focused on that. Facebook's very focused on sure. that. So many people in our audience are very focused on that. 
But thinking about the limitations is really interesting and not something Silicon Valley often does. What are those limitations? Well, it's always a shock to technologists that there are some limits to our omni omnipotence. Sorry, that was if a joke. If only we could automate all the customers, for example. That's right. You know, these customers. Very you old know, Silicon uh, Valley quote. That's right. Um, that was a joke, by the way. Please don't tweet that. <laughs> yes. Okay. I get in trouble, right? Cheryl gets in trouble, right? We're just like friends here. Uh, so where are the boundaries? When, when does the internet stop and just real bad stuff happen? And I think the answer is when you've got a civil war, like in Syria, uh, or possibly what's going on in Ukraine and Crimea, which Jared can really talk about because he's a, quite an expert there. And th there's, so, so it's clear to me, and I want to go back to sort of the technology optimist view of this. We can fix education with the internet, it's huge. We can fix entertainment and access to information and entertainment. We can fix the empowerment of women. Women are treated very poorly in much of the world. We can fix corruption and so forth. But there is a, a threshold, it seems to me. When, We've been having this debate of, Jared, how would you fix Syria? Well, to, to, to Eric's point, I think Syria and Ukraine offer two really compelling examples of a bug that exists in our techno-optimism. Uh, if you look at Syria, you have 150,000 people who've been killed, millions of refugees flooding across the border, chemical weapons used on at least three different occasions that, that, that we know of. And yet, there's no shortage of videos coming out of Syria. Um, each one of those videos is more horrific than the one that came before it. The government is setting up checkpoints to look at people's phones and see what exists on their various profiles. Um, yeah, no, no, talk about this, because Jerry was just in Syria. So, you know, I Another saw, place I'm not going. So I saw, you, you actually shouldn't go to Syria for a variety of reasons. <laughs> Thank you. Um, but I saw, I saw friends of mine that I hadn't seen in, in, in nine years, and to, to provide some context, they tell me a story about how they're minding their own business one afternoon, and all of a sudden their throats start to itch, their eyes start to water, they get dizzy, and they collapse. Fortunately, somebody came in from the other room to close the window. Um, apparently, the chemical weapons had come in um, and, 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 and affected them, and it took them a full month and a half to find out what had happened because of the information blackout. So they then go on to tell me uh, a story about how in Damascus and homes in some of the big cities, the government has set up these checkpoints where they ask you for your phone. And then they hold a gun to your head and ask for your login information, et cetera. Um, and if they don't like what they see, as was the case with my friend's brother, they signal up to somebody on top of a building and order them to shoot. And that's exactly what happened. My friend's brother was shot in the head because of something they found on his phone. And what you're left with is a realization that what Syria needs, obviously, is a physical humanitarian intervention. But it also needs a cyber humanitarian intervention in the sense that we expect dissidents and activists to be cybersecurity conscious and aware of these things. But the everyday Syrian who now has a phone and spends all day online trying to find out what's going on, they're just caught in the crossfire. And that's the largest number of people in this horrific tragedy that don't understand two-factor authentication, that don't understand why they should use the Chrome browser, that don't understand all these different things. And there's a real question that we as technologists who are geopolitically aware need to try to address, which is how do we make sure that the average citizen is secure online even if they're not physically so, secure. So, so in the book, we use the example of Somalia, and we say that the, imagine, for purposes of discussion, Somalia was largely, it, I, the government is better, better now, but imagine no government at all for a while. And, but imagine the telecommunications industry, which is roughly 11% of the GDP and is the only legitimate, profitable business in all of Somalia, Somalia and everyone has smartphones. But there's nothing else. So the smartphone at that point becomes even more important. It becomes how you know where your friends are. It's how you get an alert that there's the other gang is around the corner. It's a safe routes. We heard a story when we were in Libya of schoolgirls who had used Google Maps to watch where the NATO bombing was so they could get themselves to school safely. So think about the importance of a smartphone. Now, imagine that you're wandering along in Somalia and your smartphone is taken by somebody and now they've got your contact list, your friends, they can impersonate you, and so forth. These are very weighty issues. It is interesting, uh, to your point, I think when you think back at the atrocities committed during war in history, there was a sense of people didn't know. People didn't know. Had we known, we would have intervened. And I think the striking thing about Syria is we know. But, but in, if I can just ask you, Cheryl, yeah. when you were at Google, one of the things, Cheryl, uh, the many amazing things she did at Google, she set up, she, she, ha she had the 
philanthropic and the social uh, consciousness that others didn't at the company. It spent a lot of time talking about development, development world, uh, growth rate, basically the problems of the third world. So it seems to me that since you started that, things have gotten better because they've gotten connected. But the other issues haven't gotten fixed. That's right. No, and that, and that is the striking thing. And it's to your point that the internet can't fix everything. So let's talk a little bit about the military. This is a big honor, but uh, General Ann Dunworthy is here with us today. She is the first woman who ever became a four-star general in the US military, and it's an honor to have her. And uh, becoming a dear friend of mine, which is exciting. Let's talk about how this affects the military. So you show up in Baghdad. They did give you a flak jacket, but it wasn't sufficient. I understand that. And we'll come back one other day and explain. The general will explain to us why the flak jackets are made they are. But how does this affect the military? Well, let's, uh, l my immediate reaction was we're still fighting the wars the old way rather than the new way. So all of our interventions seem to basically involve trying to deal with the citizens. What's the best thing that you can do for the citizens? Empower them. What's the best thing the military can do? Build them Wi-Fi towers and a reasonably protected fiber optic network, right, so that they can actually learn what's going on, empower themselves, figure out that the previous dictator was lying to them, right, get all the facts, right, and then develop whatever kind of society that they're going to develop, along with economy and so forth. This is the last thing the military does, not the first thing. So one simple answer would be that since almost all of our fighting ultimately seems to involve civilians that can then be turned against us by evil people and so forth, Jared talks a lot about how the internet can change the perception of people. You know, they have, they're in a religious school. This is the only way. This is the only way. There's no doubt. Right? So one of the things that the internet can do is can empower individuals. The natural strengths of the society can come out. Why don't we build those wireless networks? In Iraq, we came to learn that Saddam had not allowed people to use cell phones at all. And so after he was uh, essentially in hiding, they started to have their, use, their first cell phones. Uh, we learned in Burma when we were there that the, the SIM cards were about $5,000, which is a, a, a fortune for anybody in Myanmar. And of course, after we were there last summer, they lowered the price of SIM cards from $5,000 to $5. And then the phone system fell over, over capacity. But, but if, you, if, you, if I can chime in on the, on the military side of it, we, we interviewed a group of, of Navy SEALs that had been on the Bin Laden raid the process of researching this book. And we asked them, you know, what is the ideal technology that you wish that you could, you know, have in combat? And we expected things like, you know, robotic dolphins and sort of various other weird things. And they said, we don't need a new technology developed. What we need is for the procurement cycles to change so that we can bring our iPhone or Android into combat and keep track of where our colleagues are. Wow. They said, right now, when I one, one, of, my, one of my friends um, told me that right now, when he has to jump out of a plane, um, he literally can't bring the bat. He, he can't, you know, they, they have this tablet attached to them and a battery that's this big that lasts an hour and a half um, because they're not able to use over-the-counter technologies in combat. So that's one issue. The second issue is we talk a lot about the military-industrial complex. As it pertains to cybersecurity as a critical aspect of our military, we have a real challenge in the sense that cybersecurity is not achieved without agility. And agility is extremely compromised by the traditional ways that procurement cycles work. And then the third piece is if you think about how we if you think about traditional military assistance, helicopters, tanks, you know, various weapons, you know, when are we going to get to a point where you know, providing cyber assistance to countries that are being attacked by more powerful countries that are not just their physical neighbors, but their adversaries many continents over? So this is a critical piece. So what should we do about the Syrian electronic army? They are trying, they're organizing to do cyber attacks against Western targets. Are they a serious target? Is there, is there some military strategy there? Is there some digital strategy? I don't know. But that needs to be in the conversation. Well, and the Russians, what's interesting, the, you, know, you have this foreign fighter problem in Syria. You have 15,000 foreign fighters who are coming from all across the globe to fight in the civil war in Syria on one side or, or, or the other. By the way, a third of those are coming from Europe, and a third of the contingent coming from Europe are converts. Um, so it's a, it really is a, a global problem. What's interesting and what's new that I've never seen before until Syria is the Russians are sending foreign fighters into Syria, except they're not 
coming to fight the physical war. They're literally sending software engineers to come fight on behalf of the Syrian Electronic Army. And sometimes they're sending them physically, sometimes they're fighting from, from and afar. Presumably in conjunction with Iran. Right. So let's move from the military focus to the economy. So one of the things that happens with the advent of all this technology and so much, and so much progress and so much efficiency is a real crisis for jobs all over the world, particularly for the youth. How do you think, both of you, and I think Eric, particularly with your Google hat on, because I know from my time at Google, you cared so deeply not just about Google as a company, but about the impact Google has on the world. And I think you've done an amazing job leading there. No, I mean, Google has always had that. And I think all of us, Facebook, we all, we all want I to have Facebook, that. Facebook we we want to have that. We want to have, have it since. How do you think about, I know you travel broadly in the developed world as well. How do you think broadly about the impact technology has on jobs and particularly for the youth unemployed throughout Europe, throughout Asia. It, it seems to me that the jobless problem is going to be the defining problem for most of the rest of our lives. As interesting as it is to talk about Ukraine and Syria and so forth, we, we live and work in this e economics we've accepted. And roughly speaking, for the last decade or so, there's been quite a displacement of manufacturing jobs because of automation. Um, it's well now documented that uh, you need fewer people to build the car, the, cars are more, the process is more robotic. With advances in artificial intelligence and computers, many of which are done in this area, uh, this problem gets work for knowledge workers who have relatively repetitive jobs. And there turn out to be a lot of such categories. So corporations, if you look in the United States as a classic example, are substituting essentially labor for capital. In other words, they're basically uh, capital for labor. They're actually investing ahead of hiring. And the people who win in this process tend to be the incumbents, they tend to be the middle-aged, and they tend to, be in the, tend to be the elites. So if you model out going forward, you have a very significant problem because of the, uh, the, the lack of jobs. Now, <clears throat> there are economists who believe that there will be jobs, that we don't have a jobless problem, but, but it's a transfer of middle-class, relatively high-paying jobs to service jobs. And think of this as sort of the Uber driver, right? A, a talented person who's working in a normal job and they're laid off or, or, they, or something bad happens. And so now they have contingent employment in a job, which is a service job, and they do the best that they can. And there are plenty of examples of that. And most economic thought says that jobs it will be less predictable, especially for young people. They'll be more contingent and so forth. Now, there's a separate set of public policy issues around that. Because in that situation, you need some kind of a social safety net. We can have a debate as to how to do that. But you basically can't have people begging on the streets in America. It's just not going to be OK. Um, and in Europe, you have the problems are, are effectively worse for the reasons that you can imagine, lack of, job, la lack of capital formation, lack of competition, lack of globalization, and so forth. So in talking, and this is something that I've been working on for, the, for this year, and I, in talking to people, I think there's a couple of solutions, and they're not good enough. And I would ask everybody here to help me think about how we're going to solve this problem. Because if it is the defining problem, especially for the next generation, it's our problem too. The first is, you've got to fix education. We can debate how to do that, but you're going to have to have a more educated workforce because the uneducated jobs are being automated out. That seems relatively straightforward. And we all believe in this. We watch this happening every I day I think here. we're clear. I think the next thing you have to do, uh, and by the way, I should say that, that you and I were with Mark, where Mark gave a very similar speech last summer. Yeah. So I know, I know that Mark, Mark agrees with me on these things. The second thing is to focus on immigration, right? Not because we want to replace the current workers by immigrant workers, but because immigrants tend to form companies. Uh, there's a lot of correlation with, with sort of great outcomes from allowing immigration. Another one is connectivity, right? To build global brands. And then the, other one, then the fourth one that is missed, I think, is you've got to create an environment where incumbents can't block new entrants. So you have to have a place, right, some place where startups can flourish, where the regulators won't kill them. Now you sit there and say, well, isn't that kind of obvious? Most industries are highly regulated, and without passing judgment, the regulators and the regulatees have gotten to know each other really well. And the new startups, the incumbents, the new ideas, they're not at the table. So an awful lot of the regulations tend to favor the incumbents or the structural incumbents. You got to fix that. This may not be sufficient, but I'm sure that the list I just gave you is necessary. No, I think there's no doubt. And you also one, have a one, lot. One more thing. Yeah, just, just, so 
So here we are, we're all obsessed with China, China's tremendous success, great job. So here you are, and imagine that we're the equivalent of the Politburo, and we're having a conversation about China in 20 years. We look at the demographic trends, disastrous one-child policy and all of that, and then we look at the automation trends, and then we realize that a couple hundred million people's jobs, which are in these manufacturing sites, are gonna be replaced by robots. What are you gonna do? It's not just a US problem, it's not global just problem. a European problem, it's a global problem. So there are also benefits sure. to technology, and some of them are personal, and your first chapter in the book is our future selves. I'm gonna read one of my favorite passages. There will be no alarm clock in your wake-up routine, <laughs> at least not in the traditional sense. Instead, listen to this, everyone, you'll be roused by the aroma of freshly brewed coffee, by light entering your room <laughs> as curtains open automatically. This is my favorite part and by a gentle back massage administered by your high-tech bed. Eric's <laughs> wife is here. He gives you that every morning, right, Wendy? So you don't need this to be built because Eric is administering the back massage. But for the rest of us, for the rest of us, you're more likely to awake refreshed because inside your mattress, there's a special sensor that monitors your sleeping rhythms, determining precisely when to wake Doesn't you up. Doesn't everyone have one of these? So, not, so, not, so as not to interrupt your REM cycle. Your apartment is an electronic orchestra, and you are the conductor. With simple flicks of the wrist and spoken instructions, you can control temperature, humidity, ambient music, and lighting. You are able to skim through the day's news on translucent screens while a freshly cleaned suit is retrieved from your automated closet because your calendar indicates an important meeting today, et cetera, et cetera. So I need this, all of this. <laughs> would anyone, just raise your hand if you would enjoy the mattress with the monitors for your REM cycles and the gentle back massage. <laughs> That's right. The only thing I need more than this is a self-driving car. My, my oldest child is eight. I've been very clear with Larry and Sergey with you. Before he can drive, I need the self-driving car because I feel quite confident that Google's technology is going to be better than his driving. Certainly at the age of 16. <laughs> Certainly at the age of 16. Right. But I also would really enjoy all of this. Where do I get one? Is Google X working on this? Well, there are plenty. This there seems are, like several products I'm going to have to buy yes. together. Or maybe our, this is one product. Our, our daughter, Sophie, actually invented that scenario <laughs> because she sort of wanted it. And I think, I think it's going to happen. It's a, uh, when you go through the analysis, every component that's in that description is available in some form today. You can, in fact, have um, a REM sleep cycle that wakes you up. And the, the book goes on to describe talking to the equivalent of a wall um, that says, do I need to get up? And the wall says, no, you don't. And the reason is that, again, with your permission, it's figured out that, you're, that the airplane's gonna be late, your boss is sleeping in, no one's gonna call you. Will you use that service? You betcha, because you want, you want so another So all those years months. I worked for you, someone could have told me when you were gonna be late, right. not that you were late often, but if you were gonna miss it, That's I could right. have had an extra half an hour exactly. of sleep. How, how realistic are some of these changes? Well, certainly, the, certainly the, the physical things, right, the timing and so forth are real. But I think the next generation of computer technology, and, and I, I'm happy to say that I think Facebook is working on similar areas of AI and research, are really about going from sort of the uh, searching and questioning kind of model that Google has pioneered to a model which is much more suggestion and assisting, right, surfacing ideas, telling you things. Google is experimenting with this thing called Google Now, which is beginning to work pretty well, where you have these Now cards, and it says things, relatively straightforward things, like how long it will take you to get to work, how is the traffic doing. And as, we, as the AI gets better... A friend of mine was in a meeting, yeah. and it beeped, and it said, you need to go. You have a meeting in the city. Good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, this no, also... I'm so sorry. No, another example is take a look at the a company called Waze. Uh, which uses crowdsourced, uh, crowdsourced calculations about traffic to give you optimal traffic routing. That's another example of this. There's example after example of human intelligence crowdsourced plus AI applied to it, applied to some kind of physical map or infrastructure that helps make your life better. I think in five or ten years, the kinds of things that that opening scenario talks about will seem pretty straightforward in one form or another. This will obviously affect us, not just our own sleep patterns and being on time and freshly brewed coffee and massages, which again, sounds awesome. Thank you for painting the picture for me. 
But it affects us as parents. Jared, one month to go? Left, uh, <laughs> Three weeks to a, go? A little more than a month. A yeah. little more than a month, you'll yeah. become a father. Yes. And in the book, you both uh, say that parents are going to have the privacy and security talk even before the sex talk with their kids. I I'm going to. You're going to. How are you going to take, and you've obviously, long-term father, this was further in your past. But he, Jared, but he Jared has terrible needs, naming advice for me. What, what, Jared, what, what Jared, did you say Jared, I should name my daughter? Jared needs, Jared needs to learn a little bit more about being a parent. He's already figured out <laughs> what's going to happen when the daughter's 10, 12, 14. He hasn't quite figured out who runs the household. Yeah. But th to me, the key question is, are you the kind of parent with a baby where you want your baby to sort of really stand out? In the book, we say that you're going to need to give your child a unique name. So he or she shows up first in the search results. Now, right? And, and what, Is that no, no, unique no, no. or with and, A? And, and if you're one of these people who's just trying to get along and have a good time and so forth and so on, you give sort of a generic name, right? So you're sort of buried. So I asked Jer Jared, which child are you going to have? And if you know Jared, you know it's going to be a standout daughter. So you clearly a standout she, name? You should name her Broomhilda. Broomhilda <laughs> Cohen. Uh, no, needless to say, I, I, when I floated that idea, I slept on the couch that night. Um, Which doesn't have the massage. It does not have the, the massage. But, but it, but no, it, no, but, but why don't you like my name? Um, <laughs> Broomhilda Cohen okay. would absolutely be the it's top sorry, result. Broomhilda? Broomhilda. Broomhilda. Yeah, I mean, it's just it's not. A it's, 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 it's a German name. It's a German name. It's a deal breaker. It's a but, deal breaker name. But, I don't even understand the name. But here's, so uh, let me, let me give you. What's wrong with my name? There's nothing wrong. It's, it's, I just, it's hard to understand if it's Rumilda or Broomhilda. Broomhilda. Let's just, let's just not even go there. Can anyone the, in the audience spell Broomhilda? Here we go. I've yes. been working. I've been Perfect. working. All right. I've been working on Jared's wife on this, and she's slowly coming to my. She's view. not coming around at all. She's being nice. <laughs> but let me, so, let me, so let me let me give you this, a, a sort of example of this, and and uh, let me also give a more a more serious um, uh, thread to this, which is you know, one of the things my wife and I are seriously going to do is we're going to create an email address for our daughter once we figure out what we're going to name her, and we're going to CC her on all the photos that we send out to the family, and then hand over her password when she turns so 18. So when she gets online, but, but she's going to have 10,000 unanswered emails. Yes. <laughs> that Jared, is really? I Jared. mean, when I have unopened emails, I feel like I need to open them. So that's your gift to your daughter? <laughs> Look, I haven't, I haven't really thought about this she's behind in a lot of detail. before she starts. Yeah, but she's ambitious. She'll catch up. It's fine. <laughs> Um, but let me give you. But let me give you. So there is a, there is a sort of interesting and and, and uh, more serious aspect to this. To sort of. I think he's very serious. <laughs> he is actually going to do this. It'll I also. Be I, Cohen at gmail.com. I, I also I also had the idea. This is still getting into areas of levity. I had the idea that I don't really want unsupervised parties in our, our new apartment. And so uh, when our daughter is old enough, I'm going to make her and all her friends hand over their devices when they walk yeah, into the, well, for that. <laughs> Eric told me that I will be like the losing father of the year if I did that. You're, they're not going to come to your house. No. But, so, <laughs> but there, is a, there is a serious aspect to this, which is we've, you know, we've traveled all over the world together, and we've made it a point to talk to parents you know, from Saudi Arabia to various parts of Asia to Latin America, et cetera, on how they're thinking about this. And you know, it's interesting, the stakes are actually quite high. It's more than just, you know, your child posting things that might hurt their chances of getting a job. Um, and, you know, Saudi Arabia stands out as an interesting example of this. So you talk to Saudi parents, and their nightmare scenario is their daughter at 10 years old is, you know, chatting with somebody of the opposite sex, saying things that maybe she shouldn't say, um, but because she's 10, it's not an issue. But the question that they ask is what happens when the things that she says, which live in data permanence, follow her around like a digital scarlet letter until somebody chooses to take it out of context when she's 25. Now, we talk a lot about honor killings in terms of the physical world. There's a real concern that with data permanence, reputational damage that can be caused by oh. things being taken out of context might be the virtual version of an honor oh. killing. And, and you talk in the book about insurance for that. No, no. An we, insurance market I don't think exists today. You well, could take it, out insurance it, it makes, it on makes, your identity, it, on your uh, reputation. Uh, uh, we argue in the book that identity will become so important that you would take that out people, insurance. That people will, will obsess about these kinds of questions. And a more serious <laughs> example is, uh, and Jared likes to say that sort of the online maturity never quite catches, uh, online maturity matches physical maturity, which is never quite as good as a mature adult in teenagers, right? We all understand this. So imagine the 16 or 17 year old antics all written out there, and now the same person at 25 is looking for a job, and all that stuff's out there. Are there examples where that information has been used against these candidates? Absolutely. 
is does that seem right to you? Doesn't seem right to me. And in fact, in our system, for hundreds of years, it's been true that if you commit a, if you're a juvenile, at below 18, and you commit a crime that's within some bounds of, of not murder, Doesn't follow you. Yeah. Um, you can actually go to a judge after an appropriate sentence and so forth and have the record be removed from the court and you can legally say you were never convicted of a crime. That is obviously impossible today, given, given the online changed. world. Is that fair? I'm not so sure. So the last question I'll ask, and obviously a very important one to me, and I know to both of you, and then I know we're going to take questions from audiences, so please submit yours from the audience, is on women. Um, obviously something I'm deeply passionate about. And unsurprisingly, but I think quite sad, the benefits of technology don't equally accrue to men and women today, much as the benefits of leadership. So women are nearly 25% less likely to be online all over the world. Part of that is due to not having the capital that men have to buy technology. Part of that's due to the investment we make in education. Women are, you know, much more likely to be illiterate because parents will put, and society will put their boys in schools, not their girls, which makes them less able to earn the money, less able, less able to use technology. Uh, there was a report just put out that if you got internet access to an additional 600 million women in the next three years, which given the rate of growth is not out of hand, should be able to be possible, but not gonna happen at the same rate as men, you would increase GDP across 144 countries, which are the poorest of the countries, by 13 to 18 billion. So we know that investments in women pay off for our economy, and we know investments in women pay off at higher rates for the well-being of children and their health and their, and their, edu and their own education. So it's a very good virtuous cycle. But we're caught in the non-virtuous cycle of investing more in men in all ways, including in technology. How do you think this changes? How do we make sure people understand all over that this technology has to equally be in the hands of women and, and as men. Jared, I know you've worked on this at the State Department. Yeah, so you know, one of the things that Secretary Clinton used to say is, you know, we talk a lot about women's issues, but she would remind us that more than 50% you know, of the world's population are women. So whether you're talking about non-proliferation, counterterrorism, you know, civic activism, you could literally talk about any issue in the entire world, and it's a women's issue by virtue of the smartest people on earth being women and the majority of people on earth being women. You know, to me, what I would say is, I we think, appreciate the compliment. <laughs> but I, but I, I think you could make your statement even uh, in, a, in a way that's even stronger in the sense that I think there's something that the numbers don't account for. So I've spent a lot of time in autocratic countries and in particular religiously restrictive societies that either by law or norm have held women back. And there's an observation that, that, that I've made and many of my friends have made, which is when women, for instance, in the Middle East get a chance to go to school, they outperform the men exponentially, right? And you know, it, 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 it's, it's a- As they do here. A as they do here. Um, and what's interesting, a, a, a friend of mine in Kuwait mentioned, told, told me something very interesting um, that may or may not be true, but she said, you know, the problem we have in Kuwait right now is we need more women's empowerment. But if you game this out five years now that women are all going to school, the men, 80% of the men work in the government, which means they don't show up and they just go to shopping malls and play video games all the day. So she said, fast forward five to seven years, and in Kuwait, you're going to be talking about a need for men's empowerment. <laughs> so Cheryl, you, you'll remember when, when we did this about 10 years ago, you started talking to us about micro-lending. And it turns out that the great success in the developing world was micro-lending, and the people who managed all that money were women, because the men were louts. And that's my simplification <laughs> of the description that I was given. And I think that that's probably true with phones and connectivity as well. So I think it's not too hard to see that if we just figure out a way to get inexpensive phones, by the way, the prices, the low price on an Android phone in China is about $100. These are very powerful smartphones. Those prices are falling, more or less correlated with, with Moore's Law. So you could imagine $70, $50 within three to five years, which are price points which even in a micro-lending situation, people can use their smartphones. And imagine that that phone is loaded with uh, information about literacy and culture and things like that. You could, in a small number of years, with, uh, by giving these phones effectively to women, solve the educational problem, the early childhood education problem. There's a lot of correlates with respect to childhood uh, IQ and involvement of parents and so forth. You could uh, talk to women about taking care of their kids when they're very young, helping them do all of that. You could have a huge change. I mean, like hundreds and hundreds of millions of people that are empowered. Eventually, they've got to win against the oppressive male structures. 
I just can't imagine when you when when, when we were in Saudi Arabia, the women behind the veil, they're texting. Right, they're communicating. Right, they're incredibly intelligent. What a powerful right. image! Right, behind a veil. Behind the veil. But but texting. And, and they're and so connecting with the world. Well, the, be, the, <laughs> the best professors, the best achievement, and so forth. We actually visited one of, one of these uh, universities. At some point, the men just have to give up. Right. Well, Cheryl, can I? There, there's a there's a the, this notion of behind the veil is very interesting. There, there's a story that I, I can't resist. Telling when we were in Pakistan, we, we met a group of women who'd been attacked by the Taliban with acid. Something people talk a lot about in Afghanistan, but don't talk about as much in Pakistan. And we went to visit these, these women, and, and through no fault of their own, the physical scars that they bear, they carry a terrible stigma in society that doesn't let them work, uh, you know, doesn't allow them to walk on the streets without being ridiculed, etc. So we're talking to these women, and we ask them how they're able to be so optimistic, and one of them smiles and, and shows us her phone. And they all live in this house together, and they're you know, training in, in, in various technical skills and learning how to surf online. And one woman said to us that you know, she loves the internet because online her scars are invisible. So the internet's given her a second chance at life. Now, you think that's amazing. This woman then met a man online who she started chatting with, who eventually she met in real life, and now they're married. So you, know, you think the internet doesn't matter. I can't think of a group of women that are more disenfranchised more humiliated, more beaten down than acid victims in Pakistan, and you look at how the internet has literally allowed them to once again enjoy life and enjoy its benefits. Yeah, it's an amazing story. So I know we're gonna take audience questions. Yes, you have them. Yes. Okay. How will issues to net, related to net neutrality, I think this one's for you, Eric, affect easy and cheap access to bandwidths? What are some proposed solutions? In the developing world, most of the um, telecoms are still monopoly or near monopoly providers. And you're not going to get really good internet access until you have competition in those places. An example is that in Africa, the average internet connection costs more than it does in the United States. You can imagine how foolish that is. Right. And if you divide that by the and percentage just, of just, GDP, it's, it's astronomical. It's just, it's just, it's just a terrible yeah. thing. And so the bigger problem, I think we can solve the smartphone problem with price because it's a consumer product. But an even bigger problem is going to be getting the reasonably quality bandwidth of these countries and getting those networks upgraded. So we need that competition. In the US, a lot of people have been studying this. How do we do this? We do not have common carrier laws that apply to the internet. And so a combination of public pressure so that the internet is not used to favor particular content, but ultimately I think our answer remains the same, competition. If you only have one provider of something and you don't have another choice, that would be an example of not having enough competition. Can you comment on digital currencies? and the effect on economies and empowering Jared, people. Jared, how this are your bitcoins? Such, how are bitcoins? How are your bitcoins, how are bitcoins I'm doing, Jared? I was wise enough to not buy any. Um, I, I am so fascinated no, no, by this. He was this. just about to buy some. <laughs> I well, the Bitcoin, the Bitcoin defenders are saying if one bank that holds dollars goes out of business, it's not the dollars, it's the one bank. It's called the Federal Reserve. You yeah, work no, no, there. I, I'm well aware. Cheryl, but, you actually but understand this better than anyone in the world. But nonetheless, it's half a billion Bitcoins that are gone, right? This weekend. Is that right? Six percent. Yeah. So, I, so, I think so how, how are digital currencies going, Jared? So I, so I think there's a few ways to look at this. One, you know, I, I think we, we typically make Bitcoin synonymous with, with cryptocurrency, and there's obviously a lot Fair of enough. examples Fair beyond enough. Bitcoin. So the, I think the, the question you have to ask is, is cryptocurrency here to stay in some form? And I think the answer is yes, that trains le left the building. Um, you know, then the second question is, how long will unregulated cryptocurrencies last? Can we just ask Cheryl this? She actually works in the Treasury. She actually <laughs> is the expert Well, no, no, no. I mean, Come I'm on, not. When, but when is the U.S. going to step in and regulate this? I, I don't know. Honestly, I don't know. It was very interesting. It was a really good article. I forget who wrote it, but they explained Bitcoins, and they said Bitcoins for school children. And it said, I have an apple. I give you the apple. You give me whatever for the apple. Now I own the apple. I don't need a regulator. This story was written before this weekend or last week, right? Yeah. And I think, I think this is something that people There's, didn't understand. And the, the point people have made is that this is secure because of the crowdsourcing aspect of, tra well, of, well, of tracking. Yes. Um, I think you studied in, <laughs> when you were at Harvard the depression. Yeah, no. 
Right. And there's a run. So, Currencies so, have yeah, this. So, uh, the technical answer in bitcoins is that bitcoins is a remarkable cryptographic achievement. And the ability to create something which is not duplicable in the digital world has enormous really, value. Really, and hard. It's very hard, but it's incredibly useful for many, many computer applications. So without commenting on whether the Bitcoins will get regulated, because you're the expert, not, <laughs> and uh, mm, no you guys are the expert, not me. Bit the Bitcoin architecture, literally the ability of, of having these ledgers that can't be replicated, is an amazing advance, and lots of people will build businesses on top of that. But one of the other problems that people don't talk as much about is the digital wallets, right? So, you know, there, there's a question of how secure uh, the, the cryptocurrency itself is, but if the digital wallets themselves that are supporting this ecosystem aren't secure, it's a whole other problem. So a good example of this is the Canadians you know, tried their hand at, at cryptocurrency. They had something called uh, Mint Chip, which was pegged to the Canadian dollar. And they ultimately shut it down because all the digital wallets were getting hacked. And so if the digital wallets aren't secure to support the, the cryptocurrency ecosystem, then we're missing half of the, the, the challenge. I remember when, when PayPal first came out and talking to the, our friends at eBay, I was shocked at the number and of the kinds of attacks that eBay and PayPal faced, especially from country from, from a whole bunch of non-US countries. It's important to remember that when you, when you have these e economic systems, there's an awful lot of people trying to break into them. And I think that's going to be permanent no matter what, what, uh, no what matter happens. What. How do you see human interaction evolving in a world that is increasingly automated? It seems the more connected we become, the more distant we become from living in the physical world. And it's interesting because this is something you wrote about in your book. In your book, you wrote, there are two worlds at once. This virtual world where we all experience some kind of connectivity and a physical world where we still have to contend with geography, randomness of birth, bad luck, and the good and bad sides of human nature. Your book explores the ways this virtual world and this physical world interact. And I think both what you said and this question really get to that. How do you see one impacting the other? I'm working on turning off my phone during dinner. <laughs> you know How's that you're, going? You're never going to do it. How's that going? Wait, we have real life. Wendy? What percentage we're doing? <laughs> 80. 80's good. I'm working on it. You know, it's difficult. Dinner is short. <laughs> you know, short, I can but count uninterrupted. the minutes, right, before I can turn it back on. For what, for what it's worth, by the way, when we were disconnected from the internet in North Korea, Eric, after five minutes of not having his devices, I literally saw his thumb starting to twitch. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm saying that I, I think this is actually a medical problem. Um, more Specific than, to uh, Eric, or you think it's broader in the general population? Definitely to Eric, probably to me, maybe to everybody so, out so, here. So, you know, we, the good news is we, uh, we really have, in, again, you all together, have built this amazing interactive world. But humans are the same. You know, we do get addicted to things. There are terrible stories of people who have become online addicted with terrible outcomes. And so it's important to know where the off button is and learn how to turn it off. I'm working on dinner. Uh, <laughs> and I think the, the deeper part of the question is, what's it doing to the way we interact? And the, the sort of the traditional people say, well, you know, I don't have any friends anymore. I said, no, you have hundreds of friends. You, you interact in different ways. You're, remember the whole bowling alone? It's clearly false. Right, you're bowling with everyone. But the impact on identity is, is interesting, right? So for all of us, more people will come to know us digitally than will ever meet us in, in the physical world. Especially with your daughter. Especially with my daughter. Because her entire digital record is going to be on her email. Although I made a decision. I made and a she's going to be 10,000 emails behind. I made a decision when not she's to. she's two. No sonograms But that's online. okay. This is a Jared, great idea. Yes, Jared's decided that it's not okay to post sonograms before birth. There, there's no opportunity for consent with like a burp or a laugh or <laughs> okay. a smile or, or something. But the, the, the point is what this means. So what are you going to do? You're going to hold it up in front of the new baby saying, can I post this picture of you? <laughs> she might say yes. <laughs> uh, unclear. Uh, Good but, luck. But, but, but what the, Parenting is quite different than you think it will be before you do it. <laughs> there's nothing better than talking to someone who doesn't have kids yet. But this you, is how it's all going to work. You know what Eric told me when, when, I, when I first told him we were having a baby? His first response wasn't congratulations, I'm happy for you. It was resist the urge to think that you're the first person on earth to ever have a child. <laughs> <laughs> I forget where I was going with this point. 
<laughs> but on, 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 on identity, on identity, yeah. So on identity, because uh, we'll be better known online than will be than people will interact with us in, in the physical world. What it means is the implications of what we do online are probably of greater consequences consequence in determining our identity, and that's challenging because we have less control. So, so but, but the way to think about this is that you start off uh, your brand new baby. You have like complete control over your identity, except that you have him as your dad, <laughs> and. As you age, right, the percentage of control over your identity decreases. So by the time your daughter hit, gets to the year 2100, right, so 90-ish, near 90, think about the percentage and so forth description of her, where she was, where she did, and all the things that will happen compared to who she really is. And it's not just we what haven't we, figured and, this out yet. And it's not just what we say and post about ourselves, it's what others say and post about us. Um, so we basically are sort of one unit in an entourage of people that are shaping who we are. It's interesting. It brings up another, um, another thing I know we're all uh, working on, which is that how do we think about the responsibilities companies have for privacy and security, for the Googles, for the Facebooks, for, for everything we do, and also the increasingly American element to the Internet. Right? We are in a system, and you know this better than anyone, where countries are increasingly having voice for data localization for what has been a very good global system for the bifurcation of, of the control of data, which I think ties to the identity of their citizens because, and ties to some of the ideas you have in the book about, about virtual statehood in a virtual state. How do you think about how all of these connect, the individual privacy, company responsibility, in, in, in the and data localization? Which, in the paperback, which comes out tomorrow, um, we mm -hmm. actually say very clearly that's right. That, this is the paperback. Uh, thank you. <laughs> Coming out I got tomorrow. it early. Twelve dollars <laughs> on Amazon plus sales tax, uh, free shipping. Easily multiple times that in learning. So <laughs> and easy to carry around. Great pictures on the back. <laughs> thank you, Cheryl. Thank you. I think it's great. It's a must buy. <laughs> <laughs> you heard it here first. <laughs> so, There's even a robotic hand. By the well way, uh, that's a, uh, the cover art was done by Jeff Koons. Oh. Hold that back up again. It's really actually pretty amazing. Yeah, Jeff Koons. All the different hands. Um, the One's virtual, kind of. Or I guess real, robotic. <laughs> He's an artist. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, the Snowden revelations did a real number on our relations with a whole bunch of countries. Think about yes, Germany. Yes, they Germany for, did. Germany, for example. And Cheryl and I... I've been spending lots of time dealing with the consequences and the perception of American uh, NSA activities and so forth. And this is a good example of what will happen in the future, because countries aren't going to stop spying on each other. And no one quite knows how to solve this problem. An example is a couple weeks ago, Angela Merkel indicated that she would be in favor of actually having data localization within Germany, uh, which sounds like a great political thing, but it's one, not workable, two, it breaks the internet and is a very bad idea for the German citizens. We're facing similar issues for, and for both citizens companies. all over the world. It was, we're facing similar issues in Brazil for both companies and so forth. So I don't think we've quite figured out all the consequences of, of that on a government sense. On a privacy sense, again, Facebook has been through the same sorts of, of travails. You ultimately have to say to citizens, we will keep your information private. You have to decide. You, you have a responsibility for how much you want to disclose, where you want to disclose it. You can't just blindly assume that it's the old model. The new model has a lot more subtlety in it. So, and I did not plant this question, but I want to thank whoever wrote it. Uh, there's a lot in the press recently about the lack of women in computer science. And the numbers which you are well aware of, and we're all well aware of, is that in the, 19, in the 1980s, women were getting 35 to 37% of the computer science degrees. We're down to 13. If you believe this is important, if you believe the wage gap matters, if you understand that technology jobs are so important to future employment and they're better paid, you have to worry about equality, you have to worry about the wage gap increasing. There's a lot to worry about with women not being in computer science. Um, Google, very much to Eric's credit and to Larry and Sergey's credit, absolutely the forerunner of this. Even when I joined Google, which was not that many people were there, very focused on women in computer science and recruiting. But it's an issue for all of us because if you're recruiting from 13, if you got 13 percent, it's very hard to get women. Um, how do you think about this? How do you think about this for Google? How do you think about this uh, in terms of how we encourage more women all over the world? The, <clears throat> you can understand the, the, women, the women's lack of women in our society as sort of an escalator problem. There's sort of an escalator that people fall, follow. 
there's a lot of evidence that women get off that escalator at various points for reasons that are, have been fairly well established, and we need to address them. This is a real national crisis for America, um, and there are plenty of fields where they have figured this out. A classic example is in biology, where a majority of scientists are now women. So it is possible to do this. Um, many people, many sort of old white guys like me have talked about this, and we've not come up with a better set of ideas than empowerment, training, making the stuff cool. Um, there's a problem, as you know, with sort of in the teenage years. And again, you write about this in, in your book. Um, and I think we've got to come up with a consensus of how we're going to guide this. We need the IQ. We need the talent. It's amazing. I mean, even in our own area, so I sent my son to computer camp, ID Tech Camp. It's a great program. A lot of people do it. Uh, two years ago in Silicon Valley. So you don't know this yet. But Eric does, but you'll learn. At seven, you're pretty much deciding what your kids are doing for the summer. So it is the parents' decision. Silicon Valley, ID Tech Camp, 35 kids, five girls. Of the five girls, I put three in myself because it was my niece and her two friends. So anyone who thinks this is about to get better needs to look at that. Now, ID Tech Camp is coming out this summer, and they're doing programs only for girls to try to encourage. Um, but it's really a stereotyping problem, and I think the impact, the impact on the future can't really be underestimated. How are you going to think about this for your daughter? Well, I think, you know, it, it's... Four weeks from now when so, you have said daughter. Given I'm an expert on parenting. Um, no, I, I, I think my, my, my view on this, again, not, not being an expert on it, is, you know, start early. And, and there are, I mean, you, you hear about things like Goldie Blocks and, and, and others. You know, people are working to try to figure out how are there ways to uh, create opportunities for young girls to get inspired and excited about engineering camp is another example, but there's clearly not enough examples of this. And you can't, I, I don't believe, you can't wait until, you know, your child gets to, to, to college and is deciding a major. If you don't start earlier, uh, then you lose that, that, that early investment where it actually shapes we, what they want to do. There may be a, a solution not due to our good work, but simply because as, as the engine room stuff gets better and if you accept the stereotype of more men in the engine room, um, the opportunities at a platform layer for the kinds of things that it appears that women care a lot about to build massive new companies are clearly going to be there. And so it's possible that we will solve this problem by just moving up the stack. When I started, there were essentially no women in computing at all, uh, but nothing was visual. There was no interaction. It was very, very, very nerdy, speaking as the local nerd. And at Google, for example, we have large swaths of activities where there's a whole bunch of women working on it. They're very, very good at it. And I think that that's where the growth's going to be. So I'm very worried about this 13%, but I'm also heartened by the fact that in, in America, we're producing very, very analytically skilled women, and they're in other fields. So maybe we can attract them to work on these problems. That's right. It's one of the things I know Google's done. It's one of the things Facebook's done is we've you know, taking women with other technical skills and, and help them learn. Um, so going to towards the end of our time here, looking towards the future, one of Google Ideas goals, which I know you are now part of Google working with Eric on, is to end censorship. And I think you're not in the book, but you've said by 2024, which seems like a very specific date, uh, we're going to end censorship. Why take up this goal? What are you going to achieve it? How did you pick 2024? What's happening here? Because that's obviously something that is a a big and bold uh, aspiration. So one of the things, I mean, a lot of the travel that, that we did was to countries that were, were more autocratic. And you know, those are the places that are, that are still coming online. And you know, it seems that one of the big wild cards in the future is how will autocratic regimes fare? And every citizen that we met in an autocratic society, you, you won't find a single one that aspires to connect to a repressively censored internet, right? And so surely we should sort of help that not happen. Right, I want to see only, yeah. Um, and, and it sounds like an obvious thing, but, but I don't, you know, where, if it's so obvious, then where are the prescriptions associated with it? So we had this sort of lofty moonshot of can we make repressive online censorship irrelevant within a decade? And right now, there's a lot of people who are doing interesting proxy and circumvention work, but there, there's two problems with the existing efforts. One, uh, they don't scale because uh, anyone that is successful in this, the government quickly shuts it down. And the second has to do with trust, which is you don't know the origin of a particular proxy or tool. And so what we decided to do is you know, leverage the smart engineers that we have at the company, but also outside the company, to figure out are there tools that we can build 
that will help address you know, two critical problems. One, content being taken offline through DDoS attacks and other means, and the second is the filtering uh, challenge uh, of repressive regimes censoring the internet from its population, and we're well under, uh, underway in terms of building some of these products. I think it's, it's fair to say that the life of autocratic dictators is going to get a lot worse because of the empowerment. And it's been great, but it's going downhill. Yeah, it was a good, good gig while good you had it. Good gig while you had it. That's right. And the, the, again, it goes back to what's new, right? We've always had problems, geopolitical problems, narcissism, crazy, crazy leaders, that kind of stuff, uh, despots, et cetera. The empowerment of the individual because of the technology that we all build is a new problem for them. They can't shut the internet down completely. If you do that, the middle class assumes you're really scared and picks the other side. We talk about this in the book. So the reality is you have to work with the internet, which means your citizens are gonna get empowered. Classic example is China. China, as you know, has banned us in one form or another for, and likely to do for a very long time. So there are new services in China, WeChat and Weibo being the two most popular examples. So WeChat is an example of a link chain where you do a series of messages to a private set of group, but it can be very large. And by the way, you can do e-commerce with this and pictures and so forth, and it's heavily censored. So what happens when you have a clever idea and every person in this room thinks it's such a clever idea and you begin to send it to all of your friends and 10 million people think this is a great idea? There's not enough prisons, there's not enough police, there's not enough to hold that back. So even in a repressive regime, You've got to fear the results of empowering your citizens who discover that you're doing a bad job. We have time for one last question. I want to ask both of you. Uh, and Jared, we can start with you and then, and then uh, let Eric end. What are you most pessimistic about the future and what makes you most optimistic? What is the one thing that you're most pessimistic about in terms of the future and what is the one thing where you're most optimistic? So I'd say that the thing that I'm most pessimistic about touches on something we, we, we spoke about before, which is there's a number of challenges. You know, we'd like to think technology is a silver bullet answer for the world's problems, but there's still mass killing. There's still huge portions of the world's population Syria. living in abject poverty. And I wish that technology could instantly solve those challenges. And the reality is more connectivity betters everybody's lives, but it doesn't do... Uh, it doesn't solve the problems of socioeconomic divides, right? You know, there, there, there are limits. And so I'm, I'm, you know, I don't know if that's In fact, it may make those worse, maybe it, creating some it, of those it could, In some respects, right. it could exacerbate the problem. Um, the thing that I'm, I'm most optimistic about is the, the uh, we're, we're basically going to experience the most individually empowered global citizenry that the world has ever known. So, you know, if you think about even a place like China, in China, right, the world's most populous, repressive society, you're going to have a billion people come online in one decade in one country. It will happen one time, and it will never happen again. Um, imagine how that ability to know what's happening in the cities, uh, to have access to the world's information, to you know, have the opportunity to make choices and decisions, it, 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 it's game changing. Now, there's challenges, as we talk about in the book, but this notion that a citizen is going to be more empowered with choices and options than at any other time in history has to be a huge benefit for the world. Eric, I, pessimistic I, and optimistic. When Jared and I started the book, we didn't quite know how we would view sort of the future for the developing world as well as the developed world. And I can say that having worked on this for now three years, we're very optimistic about the overall benefits of this technology, but especially for the developing world as well as for the developed world in the scenarios that you, that you quoted. There, there are two areas that I'm worried about. Um, the first is the question of its, and I'll pitch them as races. It's a race between the good guys and the bad guys. In a situation where the technology can be militarized and used to really hurt people, the technology can allow for scale and damage. Right. And there are a number of possible scenarios there. And I worry about that. I worry that that's a race and that we don't fully understand some of the platforms and implications of things that we might be doing that might empower evil people. And we've got to think about that. We have a moral responsibility as technologists to think about it. The second one is the jobs question. And there the, the race is the race between computers and humans. And I'm, I'm, by the way, I'm clearly on the human side <laughs> on this. The humans have to win, right? <laughs> The humans have to win, and that's that means right. That I mean, there's like five or six human hands here. That's right. The humans so have just to win. The, the ratio is very, right. very good. The, the humans, humans have to win, and the reason the humans have to win is that the, the things that are uniquely human—judgment, creativity, and so forth—have to shine while many of these infrastructures are getting built, and the human systems to deal with human failings, 
governments and so forth have to be updated. And I worry that, that it's not happening fast enough. So in the first case, I worry that we don't understand who we're empowering. And the second one, I think we understand the problem, but the human systems, we're still arguing the last decade's problems rather than arguing how we're gonna politically and culturally solve the future problems. Well, uh, please everyone join me in thanking these two brilliant minds right. and great writers. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Sarah. Cheryl, thank you so much. Eric, Jared, thank you so much. I'm going to give you a chance to make your way <laughs> off okay, and just good. say Thanks. a couple of words in closing. Yeah, and, and by the way, can we say something nice about the Computer History Museum? Please. <laughs> <laughs> this has been the best venue over our, our, Cheryl and I in various formats. Jared, this is new for you. It's such a great institution. Support it. Come to it. Its legacy will last far longer than any of us. Thank you for doing such a great job. Eric, thank you so much. Thank you. You're such a good friend. I appreciate that. Thank you. Sure, it's so good to have you here. Thank you so much. That was wonderful. I know Eric and Jared have been interviewed and will continue to be interviewed about this book in many, in many settings, but I think we had a great moderator in Cheryl Sandberg today, so I hope you enjoyed that. As Cheryl mentioned, the book goes on sale in paperback tomorrow. There's a new afterward, so there's a completely different take, uh, as there would be as you continue to think about these issues. I hope you'll take advantage of that. Come see Bob Bowman tomorrow night in Peretz-Levy next week, and stay in touch with us on our website for future programs. Thanks, everybody, and have a great day.